uh, today, what I want to look at was module two, uh, perception, personality, and emotions. And again, all of this stuff is related to work, right? It's it's applied psychology as much as anything. You could think of this, this course as very much being applied psychology. And what we're doing in this particular unit is looking at these three things and how they relate to the work environment. This particular unit that we're looking at here, which now equates to chapter two, is really three, three components uh, that are independent to the sense that they're all individual topics, but they all relate together. Okay, We're looking at perception, personality, and emotions this week. And this is, again, I'll call it... Uh, a lot of theoretical background here in terms of understanding what's meant by these terminologies. And then we look at what are the implications of each of those to the organizational work environment. So that's effectively what this next unit is about. First thing that we're going to look at is this idea of perception. And we're basically asking, what is perception? The next, we're going to look at personality and what is personality? How does it affect? And then we're going to look at emotion. So basically three distinct components. And this is unit two. And you'll find that in chapter two of either of the textbooks. Again, both the textbooks are essentially the same. Uh, the cases might be a little bit different in this one. But otherwise, whatever textbook works for you. Any questions, any issues with the textbook? Any, any problems? As I say, there's lots of old copies of this one floating around. No, I, I have the, uh, the white copy. Great, great. Okay, perception. Perception is very much in the eye of the beholder. And this little graphic right here of the six or the nine really depends on how you look at things. And perception is about your perspective on things. And the fact is that your perspective is one. However, as you can imagine, people on the other side are people who are different from you, perceive things quite differently. And that is one of the challenges from an organizational point of view, is not everyone perceives the same thing the same way. So perception is really a problem for organizations because when you have so many individuals, everybody's individual concept perception or what they perceive could be different. And that leads to... Um, conflict as opposed to everyone agreeing. Now, is that a bad thing? Not necessarily. Perception means, or differing perceptions mean, that because people look at things different way, we get a 360 degree perspective on things, or we have the opportunity for a 360 degree perspective on things. So I might see something one way, a six, for example. You might see it as nine. You're not wrong. You're not wrong. And if you can convey to me that you see it as nine, and I can convey to you that you see it, uh, I see it as a six, neither of us are wrong, but each of us can understand the other person's point of view. So again, perception is important for organizations to understand and appreciate, and the value of it means that different perspectives are considered whenever we look at a problem, and because there are different perspectives considered, we get a better analysis of problems. So perception is really the process by which individuals select, organize, and interpret the sensory impressions. Now, that's a big word. What does sensory impressions mean? Well, effectively, when you think of your senses, what you can see, what you can hear, what you can touch, what you can taste, these are what are known as sensory impressions, what you get in terms of your senses. So the whole purpose of our sensing is to be able to give us some meaning to our environment. OK, now, if you are into a situation, for example, when you perceive something, because your sensory impressions may be a conflict. OK, let's say, for example, you are walking with your eyes closed. OK, walking with your eyes closed. The sensory impressions that you get are not full meaning that you can bump into something very easily because you can't see it coming. However, you are relying on your ears and your sense of touch, you know, if you're going to bump into a wall or something, to help out. So different senses will give you information. Okay, so people get different sources of information. But the whole point of it is that we, we try to select and organize what we get out of those senses. For example, in space, I'm reading... Um, I'm reading uh, 
Chris Hatfield's book right now. He got a book out called uh, The Apollo Murders. And um, it's, a, it's an interesting book. And uh, it talks about in that, you know, about this perception in space is very difficult. Because once you're up in space, you don't have any uh, gravity. And with no gravity, your ears, your limbic system, whatever it's called, that keeps your balance, goes off. So people tend to get sick up in space. It's not uncommon at all for astronauts to get sick, like seasick. This is because their system is not working as it's designed to work. You know, it's designed to work in, a, in, a, in an environment of gravity. And when you take away gravity, it throws people off. Same things with the astronauts back in the 1970s when they landed on the moon. The moon is one-sixth the size of Earth. So as a result, gravity is one-sixth. So if you weigh 60 kilograms on Earth, you're only going to weigh 10 kilograms on the moon. And the astronauts, or the, the, the Neil Armstrongs and Buzz Aldrins of the world who stepped onto the moon, had to learn how to walk on the moon. It was a, it was a, it was a novel experience for them. And they really did a lot of training before they ever went to the moon because they knew it would take a long time to be able to, to manage it. So they recognized that their perceptions would be off because of the environment they were working in. And there's a lot of work done by NASA to kind of, uh, resolve that problem before people ever go to space or certainly ever walk on the moon. Okay, what we perceive can be significantly different from objective reality. Okay, this is a, a, a real problem. Our perceptual system, such as our ears or our sense of sight, can certainly throw us off sometimes. You know, you can see, for example, when you're driving along in the highway in the summer and you can see. Uh, water on the road ahead of you, and you think, uh, that don't make any sense. There's no water there. It's a mirage, right? Well, you know, our eyes are telling us one thing. Our brain is saying, no, that's not the case. So, again, this is where we get differences in our perception. And we may think we see something when we actually don't. And objective reality is sometimes far from what we actually see or what we actually hear or what we actually feel. And this can be a real problem uh, in organizations, a real problem for people who are working in industries that are, I'll call it, technically important, flying an airplane, for example. I have a couple of little common graphics that you see. These are perceptual um, perceptual challenges right here. This this idea of this marble relative to this, and you, you look at it one way, you think it's going down, and you look at it another way, it's going up. You know, it's it really depends on how you look at it. Or this one here, you could perceive it as a vase, or you flick it and you can see that it's two faces. So again, we often have disagreements what's real. Now you say, well, that's very nice. Now that's that's good. How does this work in organizations? Well, I don't think you have to look too far to see people have different perceptions. Everything from the vaccine for for COVID to political parties to what's right to do with regards to sending kids back to school in this environment. So perception is really, really different for different people. Perception in the organization is a real problem and a real challenge sometimes if people do not see things the same way when the organization wants to see them uh, in a similar way, okay? Um, people's behavior is really based off their perception. If they perceive something as good, they will act in a way that's favorable. If they perceive something as bad, they will act in a way that's not favorable. So different people lack different ways. So how the world is perceived is really important because it affects people's behavior. So perception becomes reality for people. When they perceive something a certain way and they act on it a certain way, that's what's important. For example, the anti-vaxxers perceive, no, vaccines are no good, and they will do everything to support the fact that vaccines are no good. To understand what all of us have in common in our interpretations of reality, we need to begin with the factors that influence perception, okay? So what is it that causes our perception, and what is it that causes our perceptions to be somewhat different? Well... What is, what is it first? We need to look at it and say, okay, let's break it down into its components. And here we go into this model building again that we use in order to explain, predict, and manage behavior. 
First thing, when we think of perception, we really think of three components. The people who are perceiving, the perceiver in this case, and again, each individual perceives things differently. So we got the perceiver, and then we got what's being perceived or the target. Okay, what are you seeing? So the perceiver is seeing the target. Now, the situation that that person finds themselves in is going to influence how they perceive the target. And the situation is really critical because we're going to see in a few minutes just how situations can be influenced by different people. Did I have a question? Sorry? Okay. Sorry. Okay, so let's just let's just break these down a little bit further. Okay, the the theory says, okay, look, if we've got these three components, what exactly is the perceiver doing? What exactly is the perceiver involved in? If we think about the perceiver, then the perceiver's attitudes, personality, motives, interests, past experience, emotions, and expectations all affect his or her perceptions. Now, I don't think you have to think too far of where you because of your background or because of what you're thinking or because of the conversation that you had last or because of the environment they come out, you can perceive things in a certain way. Okay, so for example, <clears throat> you, it, it's dark and you see something move and right off the bat you think that's bad. Okay, it's not something that is pleasant. I think as humans we're, we're trained to that. We always think that the fact that we, if we're not familiar with something or if it's happening in an unfamiliar environment when it's dark it is something that's going to threaten us okay but there's all kinds of drivers that influence how we are are perceiving things okay uh, if we think about it we can break perception down into really three major components so these three this one here can be broken down into three itself we got to think about what are the factors of the percept of the situation that influence our perception. Well, the time, as I say, how much time you have. I didn't have time to look, I didn't notice. Or I had lots of time to look, I did take a very thorough evaluation of it. The work setting, the, the work setting that you find yourselves in, is it a pleasant situation? Maybe you're working at home. Maybe you're working in a classroom. Maybe you're working in a desk at work. We don't know where you are, but that's certainly gonna influence your perception. And I think the very fact of us, that we're all isolated now has created some perceptual issues. You know, um, um, you know, you perceived this morning that I wouldn't have a class because I hadn't set it up. I didn't perceive that at all. But anyway, you know, understanding where you come from, the work setting made made that happen. You know, the work setting was influenced there. The social setting certainly makes a difference too. You know, you think about what environment you're. This is occurring in. Is someone making a joke? Or are someone really, really being offensive? Depending on the situation you find yourself in, the social situation, how you perceive what someone says, it can certainly be influenced. Okay, so that those situational factors of time, work setting, and social setting definitely, definitely influence uh, how you perceive something. We also have the perceiver him or herself, you know, what, what factors are influencing the perceiver? Maybe their attitude towards something. I think you're a wonderful person, so anything you say is going to be wonderful. I think you're an awful person, anything you say is going to be awful. You know, that's really what we're getting at here is what is the perceiver motivated by and what influences do things that the perceiver think have on how the perceiver perceives? So the attitude of the perceiver. You know, huh, I don't like you. Huh. That sort of thing is really going to influence the perception. My motives. If I feel that I can benefit from 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 being positive towards something, I'll be positive towards it. Because there's a personal benefit coming to me. I'm motivated to think positively. My interest. And, and I, I'm guilty of this. Some things don't interest me. Okay. I'm not looking at things that don't interest me. It doesn't bother, you know, it doesn't matter. The latest craft at the craft fair doesn't interest me. However, if it was something I'm interested in, so, you know, if I see a, 
1980 land go by, that catches my interest. Okay, my experience is going to have an influence on me. Your experience plays a huge influence on how you perceive things because you have all this background knowledge to draw on. If you have a good bit of experience, that background knowledge is going to affect how you perceive things. You know, what may off the cuff seem to be good may not be good because your experience is said, you know, if someone is doing something for free and uh, they don't want any reward for it, why are they doing this? My experience has been that, you know, that that doesn't happen. And my expectations is going to happen. If I have high expectations, if I have high expectations in my uh, of my kids at school, I will certainly perceive them as doing well when they do well. If I don't have any expectations of them all, they do lousy, and still I'm all right with it because I had no expectations for them to start with. So that that has a big influence on how we perceive. Okay, the perceiver themselves is really up up to um, creating the perception. Finally, we got the target. Okay, what is the perceiver looking at? What what influences? does the target have on how well it's perceived? Well, novelty is certainly there. You know, if you saw two moons up in the sky, let's say, for example, you look up at the sky at night, we're used to seeing one moon up there. What if there were two? Would that be novel? Would that capture your attention? Yes, it would. Motion. Um, Facebook uh, publishes a bunch of information with regards to, uh, you know, what, what works well in terms of uh, posting in Facebook, how to get people's attention. Um, if you were to type a post that is just written, it captures very little attention. If you were to add a picture, it captures that much more attention. If you were to add motion to it, it, it triples, quadruples the amount of people who are going to see the post. Videos work better. Why? Because they have motion. Sounds like like motion, sounds obviously attract people's attention. A big bang or a, a clap will certainly capture people's attention. Something unusual. Size. The bigger it is, probably easier to see. Background. Again, if you got a white rabbit running on white snow, it's hard to see the rabbit. Camouflage. Or a, uh, I saw a uh, partridge there the other day. And the partridge was gray against the gray ground. Very hard to see the partridge. Again, background makes a big difference. If I were to put that gray partridge in snow, very easy to see. Proximity, how close it is to you. Is this something that's really close? I'm more likely to see if it's really close. If it's a long ways away, probably not going to see it. And similarity. How similar is it to the background? How similar is it to you? How similar is it to something you can relate to? If it's very similar, odds are you're going to see it. Uh, this is why I say, you, let's say you buy a new car, you buy a new Ford, okay? You buy a Ford Mustang, and suddenly you see all kinds of Mustangs. You never saw as many Mustangs before. That's common because similarity, what you have versus what everyone else has, it becomes similar. So those things, you know, if we were to do an analysis and say, okay, what influences perception? Well, we look at the various components of perception. We got the perceiver. We've got the, the target, and we've got the situation. And then we say, well, what, what is it within each of those that influences how well we perceive things? Okay, The situation, time, work setting, social setting, the perceiver, the attitudes of the perceiver, the motivation of the perceiver, the interest of the perceiver, the experience of the perceiver, the expectations of the perceiver are going to have an influence. And finally, the target. What is it that makes the target stand out? Well, novelty, in fact, it's different. Uh, the fact that it's moving, the fact that it makes a noise, the fact that it's big or small, the fact that it is relative to the background, it shows up, uh, proximity, how close it is to you, and similarity, how, how similar is something. So that that's going to influence perception. From a target point of view, again, very similar type of thing. Our perceptions are also influenced by the targeters target social status and ambiguity, lack of information about the target leads to greater need to interpret. So if we don't know anything about what's on the go with the target, it's very, it requires more thought.
and the situation. And again, we look at this idea of it can influence our perceptions depending on the situation we find ourselves in. If you don't have a lot of time to look at something or it's in a context that really doesn't make any sense to you, these things are going to influence how well you see it. So that's that's that basic model of perception, okay? Now, you say, well, that's very good. How does this rate relate to organizational behavior? What is it that is important in terms of this concept? What is it that's important within the work environment? Well, within the work environment, one of the problems that we have and one of the biggest challenges is that information is misinterpreted, okay? There's an error in the perception. And perceiving and interpreting why others do what they do takes some time and it got to relate to all, of, oh, and it has to relate to all of these factors that come into play whenever we look at it. So that's a lot of stuff to take in. So we develop shortcuts to make our task more manageable. It's just human nature. Some people could say we get lazy. Some people can say we just use gut feeling. And these are really managing all this information that comes into our minds. And, you know, we think about all this information. Here it all is. That's a lot to come into your head. So you're going to come up with some way to kind of shorten that down. So they're often helpful and at being able to make very quick decisions. You know, we see things. Let's act on it. We know our experience has shown that uh, 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 this is what we do. The problem with it is, is sometimes we're just too quick and we make mistakes based on that. So perceptions can be wrong. And these are known as perceptual errors. Now, perceptual errors can be deadly in some cases. If you're flying an airplane and you think you're flying level, when actually you're flying down, and again, you have very little to go on in terms of this, this has been the result of many airplane accidents where the pilots have lost what's called situational awareness. They don't know where they are, and they end up flying into the ground. There's a classic example of a perceptual error that has huge implications in terms of the organization. So some of the errors that distort our perceptional process include, and we talked about attribution theory the other day, selective perception, the halo effect, contrast effects, projection, and stereotyping. Okay, so now we're getting into some of the, how does this screw up our organization? Okay, what are some of the things that can throw into the mix here that considers your organization? Now, Okay, let's just put it in, again, a little bit of a tighter context in the organization. Let's assume you're the boss, and you're going to go, and you want to be able to evaluate the employee, okay? You've got a, a subordinate that you're evaluating, see how well they're doing on the job. You need to perceive them. You need to be able to do an analysis. You could also think about it, okay, you're the boss, and you're hiring someone. You're about to go and do an interview, and you're going to, be able to create some perceptions of that individual. Again, some might be right, some might be wrong. What are some of the things that can cause you to go wrong in that, okay? So that's effectively what we're looking at. Attribution theory. We talked about attribution theory in that we look for certain attributes, and these attributes will cause us to have a positive or negative feeling towards the subject, okay? Look at this young girl here. I think by all accounts, she's a pretty young girl. She's got a beautiful little smile. She's just makes you smile when you see her. Okay, she's a nice young girl, nice smile, nice, nice, nice. It gives us a positive bent. Right off the bat, it creates a perceptual, a perception for us that may or may not be wrong. Okay? So attribution theory tries to explain the ways we judge people differently depending on the meaning we attribute to a given behavior. So for instance, consider when you think when people smile at you, do you think they are cooperative, exploitive, or competitive? We we wear masks these days, it's hard to tell. But the fact of the matter is, if we see someone smiling at us, we're probably gonna see them as being cooperative and friendly as opposed to unfriendly and uncooperative. We assign meanings, and we certainly assign a lot of meaning to body language. And a smile is a very strong body language message to us that is positive. It creates a positive attribute. This girl might be the worst thing ever 
brought into the organization. But that smile is throwing us off. Okay? And that's what we mean by an error that's created by attribution theory. We can attribute positive attributes to this person when actually she may be the worst. So attribution theory suggests that when we observe what seems like unusual behavior by an individual, we try to make sense of it. So why is that person smiling? We consider whether the individual is responsible for the behavior. You know, maybe she's a happy-go-lucky person. Maybe she's a positive person. Maybe she's just a wonderful person. Or whether something outside the individual uh, whom uh, that you, whom, I got that, uh, I got that mixed up, but effectively, is it internal? Is the person smiling because they feel good? Or is the person smiling because they're looking at you and you're making them smile? Basically, that's what's going on here. Okay? Um, okay? So, if, if we think about that young girl, we say, well, what is it that's making her smile? Maybe we think it's her, maybe we think it's us. So in trying to determine whether behavior is internally or externally caused, we rely on three rules of behavior. We rely on something called distinctiveness, how unique it is, um, or consensus, which is, is everyone going to think the same way I'm thinking? Or consistency, is this common for this person to do? So, now, let's look at this concept of distinctiveness, consensus, and consistency. So, the individual behavior is that young girl's mom, okay? Uh, if we don't know this person, distinctiveness is hard to be able to assert because we don't know if she acts that way all the time. We do know the person. We say, is this normal for this person? Is this the way they are? Do they have a sunny disposition? And if they do, is it that's internally caused? Or maybe just when they see you, they smile. That's external. Consensus. Uh, do everybody think that this person is a smiler and really has a sunny disposition? You know, around the office, if you're working, oh, this person is so nice, da, 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 da. That's what's called consensus. And that causes us to attribute certain things. And that... She, you know, she's always happy to see you, or she's always smiling herself. Okay? And consistency. How often does this person do this? Is this common for this person? Now, okay. So attribution theory says, okay, we got the look at. Is this common? How distinctive is it? it? Does everyone see the same thing? And is it normal for them to do this sort of thing? Now, Errors can result because we make a judgment based on that information right there. So errors or biases distort attributions. When we judge the behavior of other people, we tend to underestimate the influence of external factors and overestimate the influence of internal or personal factors. So is the person smiling because of something that happened outside or inside? And, you know, we, we tend to overestimate the influence of internal factors. Well, maybe you're just a sunny person. And we often bring something called what's called a self-serving bias when we judge ourselves. This means we're, we're that when we are successful, we're more likely to believe that it's because of us as opposed to the work of someone else. So we tend to, we tend to bring all kinds of biases in perception. And attribution theory really says, you know, it's either internal or externally focused, and we're really going to think mostly it's internal. We have a bias towards internal. That's not the only error that we often make, though, with regards to perception. We have something called selective perception. And I think all you women out there will know men have selective hearing. Well, selective hearing is similar to selective perception, meaning that we only hear what we want to hear. Selective perception is really we only perceive what we want to perceive. So selective perception is a characteristic that makes a person, object, or event stand out, and it will increase the probability that we'll see that characteristic rather than the whole package of characteristics. So we see certain things, one thing, that's it. 
so uh, again, uh, going back to that four, if you have a Mustang, you're more likely to see everyone else. We only see certain things. We perceive certain things. I just bought a Mustang. I noticed that other people with Mustangs. There's also another one called the halo effect. And the halo effect is really, really that. You put a halo on someone. That person can do no wrong. Maybe they're a very attractive, physically attractive person. Maybe you've known them for years. Maybe they just can't do any harm because they're so nice. They're like the sweetest person you can imagine, okay? So the halo effect occurs when we draw a general impression about an individual on the basis of a single characteristic, such as intelligence, likability, or appearance, mostly appearance. Your experience of the halo effect when you allow a single trait to influence your overall impression of the person. So that young girl's smile in the picture, that's what's influencing our impression of the young girl. So it's that halo, that one item creates a halo for that person that causes a very positive effect. Now the halo effect leads to a positive perspective, but sometimes we can have either neutral or negative perspectives too. The contrast effect is an example of that. So the contrast effect looks at things relative to one another, okay? We're comparing ourselves against something else. And we we got to be able to compare and say, oh, how is this person the same as me? How is this person different than me? So our reaction to one person is often influenced by other people we've recently encountered, okay? Could be ourselves. Could be another person, you know, all people from Buckins are nice people. Oh, because I know 20 people from Buckins and the person must be a nice person. So what we're doing is, is comparing one against the other. So it's really a comparison effect. This could lead to a positive, negative, or a neutral perspective. You know, if we, if we have an attitude towards one person, that same attitude will get transferred to the other one. Similar to the contrast effect, we have projections, and that is we project things on people. Just like a movie projector were projected onto the screen. What we try to do here in this case as a perceiver is we attribute our own characteristics to the other person. If I am a man, I expect another man to do a good job too. If I'm a young person, I expect that young person to be the same as me. If I'm an old person, I expect that old person to be the same as me. Effectively, we're projecting our points of view onto that person. So people engaged in projection tend to perceive others according to what they themselves are like, rather than perceiving others as they really are. So here, for example, is an example of perception. This little graphic here, we got a rhinoceros drawing a picture, but all he can see is his nose or his rind. I suppose that's what it's called, tusk. So all his pictures, everything he draws, be it of that tree over there, notice that is showing up in all of his artwork because that's what he sees. That's an example, example of projection. We also have stereotyping. Stereotyping is probably the one that we are most familiar with because it's one that's used in normal, normal everyday life, right? And that's where we judge others based on our perception of that group of people. Okay, so all blondes are bubbly, that sort of thing. So we judge one individual versus a group. So we throw everyone into the same bucket. Now, why do we do that? You know, we talk about, just to go back to here, I just want to go back and say, when we talk about perception, uh, it's a shortcut to make the task more manageable, okay? So when we think about stereotyping, it makes the task more manageable by lumping everyone into a container. All white people are. All people from Nova Scotia are. All people from St. John's are. Okay? And this automatically makes the analysis of people so much easier. We just put them in a box and say that's what they're like. 
It's not very complicated. It's simple. It's, it's so simple, in fact, that it's often wrong. So stereotyping is a problem because we box everybody. This example here, this guy sees this, this woman, for example, all he sees is lipstick and makeup. He's obviously thinking that if a woman is in the workplace, all she's thinking about is lipstick and makeup. So, okay, so these are some key examples of errors that occur in the perception process. And we can see that that perception is common for us to do. We're always perceiving things. It's not unusual in an organization to have multiple perceptions going on, and we make judgments based on that. So again, we ask the question, okay, let's look at something specific. What, what specifically can this cause problems with? Well, you know, you think about employment interviews, it certainly has a huge influence on how you perceive people who you're interviewing. If you let your perceptual biases in, run amok, that could seriously influence people's decision and not so much worry about the positive benefits, but the negatives are really consider, you know, really concerning. You could actually screen someone out based on some basis that's wrong or screen someone in on some basis that's wrong. We also think about performance expectations. You know, oh, wow, you know, the, the idea of, uh, you know, all, all Chinese people can do math really well. So if you have an Asian origin, you can do math really well. That's, that's an expectation that is probably not right and not really fair to impose on somebody. And this is going to affect performance evaluations because if you are a manager and you're tasked with evaluating someone's performance every year, which is common in organizations that we would have an evaluation at the end of the year and, or at the end of the term. For example, we have performance evaluations in this organization I work for, you do them. I don't have any performance evaluation for anyone else except you. And, you know, that's going to influence the, the evaluations. What are perceptions? Do people perceive they were wrong? Do people perceive they were right? Uh, for example, um, instructors, this has been a problem from my perspective or from an instructional perspective. Instructors who teach harder courses, intermediate accounting, for example, tend to get dinged more than instructors who don't. Why? Because you would look at intermediate accounting and say it's probably one of the harder courses in the program. So the instructor gets mixed with that. So these are some real, real concerning areas in the organizational environment, particularly from a managerial perspective, that perceptual errors can, can really influence. The second big issue that comes into place at the workplace is personality. By definition, personality is an individual trait, okay? Everybody has a different personality. And if we think about personality, there's something called the five-factor model of personality, okay? And this is, this is one that a bunch of scientists came up with that has been used for years to say, okay, look, if we want to, to, to evaluate someone's personality, it's very hard to evaluate a personality, but, you know, you know it when you see it, but it's hard to uh, objectively evaluate it. The five-factor model is probably the closest thing we have to what's called an effective evaluation of someone's personality. And what it does is it measures personality along five factors. So it measures it on scale of one to ten. So that's what it does. So uh, the first one, the first element there, and do I have a more uh, comprehensive down here? Yeah, uh, I might. But anyway, I'll, I'll keep going. Uh, the first factor we look at is openness to experience. And generally, on a scale of one to ten, Someone on a low end of that scale is not open to new experiences. They want the same thing. They like doing the same thing over and over again. Don't get me to do anything new. I'm not open to it. I want sameness. Whereas someone who's open to experience, who rates 10, would be very open to new ways of doing things, new ideas, new, new techniques. Okay? So a personality trait, one important personality trait that was found in the five-factor model is how open someone is to experience. The next was conscientiousness. That is how concerned are they for the quality of the work, the quality of the job, the things they do, make sure it's done right. So 
someone who's conscientious. And again, zero to 10. Zero means I don't care. I'm just doing my job. That's it. Fine and dandy. See you later. I tick the boxes. That's very low conscientiousness. Very high conscientiousness is someone who ensures that they've got it done right, are very careful to look for uh, feedback to ensure that the job was done to meet the needs of the people that were receiving it, and that they will work very hard to ensure that they improve and do better. So again, conscientiousness. People tend to be on one end of the scale there or the other end of the scale. So that's an important element in personality. A third element is extroversion. Now, the opposite of extroversion is introversion. So someone on an introversion doesn't want to deal with people. They're more focused on the job, not really a people person, introvert. Whereas on the far end, it's the extrovert. Now, the extrovert loves dealing with people. They love talking to people. They got to be in a social setting. They're just social butterflies. Okay, now in the work world, being a total introvert is probably not a good thing because the fact of the matter is you have to deal with people at work and you have to have the skills to be able to deal with people. But nor is being a total extrovert because these people are out chatting all the time. They're not doing a job. They're too busy socializing. So we need someone in the middle. But the personality assessment will say people will tend to fall somewhere along that scale. The fourth one is this concept of agreeableness. How agreeable are people? Are people nasty SOBs? That's one end. They don't agree with anything. Or are people super duper agreeable? They'll roll over and be too agreeable at times. Again, on a scale of 1 to 10, we look at people who are argumentative and difficult on the low end of the scale, and people who are really agreeable on the high end of the scale. And we ask, where does an individual fit along there? We measure that. Obviously, you don't want someone who's too argumentative and, and hard to get along with, but nor do you want someone who's just a yes man. So you need to be able to, to kind of think of a personality trait that fits somewhere in the middle there. Finally, we've got this neuroticism. Neuroticism is someone who really is just uh, Kramer, if you're familiar with, uh, with uh, uh, Jerry Seinfeld or... You know, these neurotic type people, which are very, I don't know, flighty, absorbed type of individuals. And how how self-absorbed and how concerned are people about themselves versus the organization, okay? And that's what we mean by neuroticism. So we're really looking at those five elements in terms of personality. So this five-factor model has been big and it is still used. Like if we think about... How do we assess one's personality? If you did a personality test, it looks at those five factors and will assess you along those scales. So that's normally what happens. We'll look at that a little bit more after. So personality is a relatively stable pattern of behavior. And that's one of the challenges and one of the advantages of personality. Your personality is pretty well set. It's hard to change one's personality, okay? So if it's bad, that's not so good. But if, it, if it's good, that's great. At, it provides a certain degree of consistency, though, because we know you're going to behave a certain way based on your personality. And it's going to influence and enable us to predict, enable us to predict how you're going to react. So, for example, you got a very, you know, we think about uh, an environment, someone who's in a job that requires someone to be very conscientious. You know, if you're uh, responsible for people's lives, for example, you want someone to be a high conscientious person. So if you're a doctor, you need to be very high, highly conscientious. Uh, is most often described in terms of measurable traits a person exhibits, and these are those measurable traits that we talked about here. What determines your personality? And again, we've got this nature-nurture argument that outlines why personalities are the way they are. Now, we think about, first of all, the nature one, biological factors. What is it, you know, who are your parents? Where did they come from? What is the background? That's what we call a biological factor. That's a that's a, a very much a nature thing. It, that's how you were born. Cultural factors is more nurture. So what is it in your culture that's going to affect your personality? Family factors, again, nurture. How does the family act? You know, what was your upbringing? Social factors. What kind of environment are you used to working in? Ones with lots of people, few people. 
and situational factors, the situation that you find yourselves in. So these five things tend to be what influence why one's personality is the way it is. So this is explaining why a personality is the way it is. Okay, this is one of these explanation uh, theories that explain now these are the things that really cause someone's personality to be the way it is. We got this, there's all kinds of these personalities assessment tools. Myers-Briggs, if you were to do a personality test, uh, Myers-Briggs, and all of them kind of intertwine because these theories have been around for a while. So if you do a personality test now, it has elements of the five-factor theory that we talked about right at the beginning, and it's, it's kind of built into this Myers-Briggs indicator. And it's the most widely used personality assessment instrument in the world. It effectively consists of 100 questions, and we're going to look at it. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to, to determine whether someone is, and, and again, this is this idea of these five factors, introverted, sensing, thinking, judging, or perceiving. And they kind of line up with these five factors. So uh, we think about extrovert versus introverted. Extroverted individuals are outgoing, sociable, assertive. Introverts are quiet and shy. Um, extroverted, introverted measures whether it's direct, we should direct our energy at dealing with people or things. The sensing and the intuitive ones is really, you know, do you sense something? Sensing types are practical and prefer routine and order, whereas um, the other type are more big picture type. They're not focused so much on the details, more big picture. And we got the thinking and the feeling. Thinking, uh, and I should say that people who fall in one end or the other are going to drive the people who fall in the opposite end nuts. Okay? So thinking and feeling types use reason and logic, whereas feeling type use their emotions. And judging and perceiving people, judging types want to control they're very controlling, and perceiving types feel. They're, they're sucking it in. And you can imagine that you're probably going to end up falling on one extreme or the other extreme of these four types here. And that's what Myers Briggs tries to do, is tries to indicate, tries to assess whether you fall one or another. We'll look at the Myers Briggs, Myers -Briggs indicator. And as I just explained a little earlier on, this is the personality, the five dimensions of personality. And as I say, Myers Briggs incorporates that. These are not, these are two different theories, but they're basically doing the same thing. Okay, so we're looking at theories that have arisen over time to explain personality. And again, just to kind of look at these big five factors, we've got extroversion, agreeableness, conscientiousness, emotional stability, openness to experience. So in terms of extroversion, the dimension captures a person's comfort level with relationships. Extroverts tend to be gregarious. They like dealing with people, assertive and sociable. Introverts tend to be reserved, timid, and quiet. Agreeableness, this dimension refers to how readily a person will go along with others. Highly agreeable people are cooperative, warm, and trusting. People who score low on agreeableness are cold, disagreeable, and antagonistic. Conscientiousness, this dimension is a measure of a person's reliability. Highly conscious people are responsible, organized, dependable, and persistent. Those who score low on this dimension are easily distracted, disorganized, and unreliable. Emotional stability, this dimension often labeled by the converse, neurosism, is really taps into a person's ability to withstand stress. People with positive emotional stability tend to be calm, self-confident, secure. Those with a highly negative stores tend to be nervous, anxious, depressed, and insecure. And openness to experience, final dimension addresses a person's range of interest and fascinating with novel. Extremely open people are creative, curious, artistic, and sensitive. Those on the other end are open uh, of the openness category are conventional and find comfort and familiar. Now, the grand thing is, and this is the this is the, the message that cannot overstress in that there is no right personality. Okay, everybody is different. However, there is a right personality for a right job. And this is really where the human resource implications and the organizational behavioral dimensions come in here. Let's take, for example, this idea of conscientiousness. So let's just look at this conscientiousness one. The dimension of a measure's 
person's reliability, highly conscientious person is responsible, organized, depending on, and persistent. Those who score lower are easily distracted, disorganized, and unreliable. Some of the greatest thinkers and greatest artisans in the world have been low with regards to that score. Their you know, their conscientiousness will be considered low because they're so low, you know, out there. Okay, they're out there. They probably have high openness to experience too, so they. They like trying new things, you know, and peace, love, and joy, and all that sort of stuff. These people might make very good artistic people. They're the Beatles of the world. They're the, you know, the, they're the great artists of the world have tended to have the score very, very positively on those elements. Okay. Great leaders have. I've also, you know, had some issues with regards to what, what should I be? Are they extroverted? Well, Winston Churchill, one of the greatest leaders in the world, and he was a bit of an introvert. John Crosby was a bit of an introvert, you know. Uh, but again, he was conscientious. He was openly, uh, he was emotionally stable. Those things, I don't know if Winston Churchill was emotionally stable, but the fact of the matter was is that, you know, he had some traits that made him a very good leader, and these traits reflected that. So what we got to do from a job perspective or from a practical perspective is say, okay, match the personality type to the job. So certain jobs will require a certain personality type. Other jobs will require another personality type. And one of the key things we need to do is to be able to say, okay, in ourselves is what am I interested in? This gets drummed in school, but nobody, you know, you were too young at that age, but we need to be able to say, I fall somewhere on these big five-factor tables, and certain jobs will interest me and others won't. Um, you know, that's so one of the things that is often used in, in, in uh, job readiness indicators is elements of this factor model. Okay. How the big five traits influence organizational behavior? Well, this is it, because again, it's very focused on the individual. So if we think about emotional stability, what's relevant? Well, are we dealing with negative emotions or positive emotions? Are people who are lower end so vigilant that they're, they're fletchy? It's going to affect in terms of the overall job satisfaction and life satisfaction levels and lower stress levels. So if you're not emotionally stable, if you're not emotionally stable, it, it's going to have an impact on, on your life and your stress levels. So again, the job that you find yourself in is really going to be influenced or, you know, you need to be able to select a job that really meets your level of emotional stability. Extroversion. People who are highly introvert, ver, extroverted, maybe they have good interpersonal skills and great social skills, and more emotionally expressive. But on the other hand, you know, um, too much, maybe they're too chatty, maybe they're not focused. So if we get that right balance of extroversion versus introversion, it will lead to high performance, enhanced leadership, and high job and life satisfaction. Openness. <clears throat> People who are openness to new experience tend to be lifelong learners because learning is all about change. And they tend to be more creative and more flexible. So if people are open, they're, they're good for, you know, they, they can cope with training and skill leadership and these sorts of things. And you know, change is ever present in organizations. So openness is a good thing if you're looking for someone in a changing organization. Agreeableness, people are better liked and more compliant, conforming if they're agreeable. This, again, creates uh, higher levels of, of performance. Conscientiousness, uh, people put effort into it, persistence, more drive, better organized. And again, that will lead to higher performance. So, you know, 
Personality is one of those factor traits that really, really has a big influence on job outcomes. And we need to be able to recognize that certain jobs are more geared for someone of one personality type versus another. So we got some terminology here, and usually whenever you're talking about personality from an HR perspective or personality from an organizational behavior perspective or in the workplace, we hear these terms beat around that really are related to this concept of personality evaluation. Core self-evaluation is one of these terms, the degree to which individual likes or dislikes himself or himself whether a person sees himself as capable and effective and whether a person feels in control of his or her environment or powerlessness over the environment. Core self-evaluation is really something that we ask of people uh, in terms of the workplace to say, are you someone who feels that you control the world or are you someone who feels that the world controls you? Okay. And what we're looking for normally in, in high performance work environments, is people who feel they have control of the situation, more key there. So someone who can honestly evaluate their situation and say, yeah, I, I, I can control what's going on. Then we got this other term, Machiavellianism. Machiavelli was a, one of these uh, writers of many years ago and considered like a male chauvinist pig, we'll call it, okay? And Machiavellianism relates to the degree to which an individual is pragmatic, maintains emotional distance, and believes the ends can justify the means. These are, Donald Trump kind of occupies this territory, which is, I'm going to do what I darn well want to do, and uh, let's just cut to the job and get it done. Now, that may be beneficial in some environments, in other environments it may not work at all. Okay, uh, particularly if you have to get consensus amongst people and these sorts of things as opposed to, so Machiavellian is really good for this one-man show operations. I'm the king of the castle, and you're going to do exactly what I'm telling you to do, that sort of thing. That's a Machiavellian-type approach. Narcissism. Oh, we see too much of this in our day and age, and that's just, I'll call it the proverbial selfie. That's people who are so caught up in themselves that they're not worried about the environment. Someone who's very highly narcissistic. Again, Donald Trump is all about this. So Donald likes to be the center of attention. He likes the look of himself in the mirror. He has extravagant dreams and seems to consider himself the person of many talents. Donald is a narcissist. Narcissism describes a person who has a grandiose sense of self-importance, requires excessive admiration and a sense of entitlement, and is really arrogant. Donald Trump embodies narcissism. Okay? So in a workplace, we're going to see elements of all of those types of people. You're going to see the, the Machiavellian type person. You're going to see the narcissist. You're going to feel see people who are feel that they can control the environment or people feel like they're controlled by the environment. In order to kind of manage all that, we're looking for people who can really what we call self-monitor. And that is they have the ability to recognize what's going on in their emotions and be able to control them. Okay. So uh, I might be a narcissist, but I'm not going to be going out and telling people that my way or highway, that sort of thing. Risk-taking is important in the workplace. We need people to take certain degrees of risk. Now, the question is, how much risk? Is it jumping off a cliff without a parachute risk? No, that's stupid. But is it putting on a parachute, making sure the parachute works, and, and trying to see if we can jump at an airplane and, and land successfully? You know, there's a very high probability it will succeed. You need people to take certain degrees of risk. Certain organizations are more open to risk. Certain people are more open to risk. And depending on the nature of the organization, risk is going to be very important. Uh, the 3M company, the Scotch Tape Company, the Scotch Tape Company hired people back in the 60s who were very open to risk. They stressed that. So that was one of the criteria they used when they hired people because they wanted to have a bunch of people working for them who were always innovative, people coming up with new ideas. So they made a corporate, they had a corporate policy back then, and I don't know if they still do, that basically says that every five years, 25% of their revenue has to come in products that didn't exist five years before. 
So they're always in, innovating things, always making new stuff. And that's where Scotch tape came from. And that's where post-it notes came from. You know, it was this idea of risk taking in their workplace. We also got a terminology that you often hear associated with personnel, and that's type A and type B personalities. Type A personalities are people who are hard driving, let's get the job done, very focused ugh, people. Sometimes I can be like that. Type B personalities are more laid back and okay, I'll do it. You tell me what to do, I'll do it. So that's type B. Now the the thing is you want a good balance of that in the workplace. Type L A personality are fast, quick, but they're also stressed. And they can suffer heart attacks and die on you and these sorts of things because they just are going flat out all the time. So we need people type B to be slower and more thoughtful. We talked about in law, we talked about this idea of um, sober second thought. We need people to be thoughtful and thinking and evaluative. So different jobs really require different types of people, but organizations tend to require from both extremes. Final concept of emotions and how do emotions or where do emotions fit in terms of employability, okay? And if we think, you know, there are really six basic types of emotions. There are happiness, sadness, fear, disgust, anger, or surprise. Now, emotions, we got to ask, well, what exactly are emotions? Well, they're intense feelings that are directed at someone or something. So, you know, they're they're really intense. And that's that's interesting from an employment point of view, too, because how intense is intense and what impact does that have on someone's ability to do the job? Now, emotions are a little bit different than moods. Or, and moods are feelings that are less intense than emotions and lack of context. So your mood is not necessarily affected by something that's going on outside. It's just, I'm in a bad mood this morning for no reason whatsoever. Now, it's tied with your emotions, but emotions tend to be longer. Your emotions tend to be um, more easily determined uh, as an individual over a longer period of time. They're more intense and they're more consistent. Moods, people can have different moods flipping around. So emotions uh, <coughs> tend to be more of a fleeting thing. So emotions are reactions to a person, seeing a friend at uh, work may make you feel glad. Or an event, dealing with a, a rude comment, make you feel angry. Moods and contrast are usually not directed at a person or an event. So if we look at emotions and moods and, and the effect of this, we look at the effect, defining a broad range of feelings that people experience. That's, that's what we're looking at is how do, why do people, so effect can be experienced in the form of emotions and moods. So emotions are caused by specific events. They're brief in duration, they're specific and numerous in nature, many specific emotions such as anger, fear, sadness, happiness, disgust, surprise, usually accompanied by distinct facial expressions. We can certainly see someone's emotion in their face. They often wear it. And uh, they tend to be action-oriented, you know, the, the fright, fight or fl fight or flight emotion, for example, just to want to stand up and give it to them or say, I'm leaving here, see you later. Moods are caused by any number of things. So they're general and unclear. They last longer than emotions, uh, more general. So they tend to be positive or negative. Um, generally not uh, indicated by distinct expressions. You can't really read it on someone's face. And they're more in our mind than anything else. So from a workplace point of view, Emotions are actually critical to rational thinking. We have emotions built into us in order to preserve. It's, an, again, a natural, a natural human sensation to preserve life. Back in the days of cavemen, let's go back to our cave. You know, if we saw something dangerous happening, we would want to run away from it because it, you know, our life depended on it. So we must have the ability to experience these emotions to be rational. Because if we feel that way, we, we've got to cognitively, as we talked about it earlier, from a perception point of view, we've got to be able to perceive why is this happening? What's different? What's the change? How do we get back to normal? 
So they provide important information us, on us to help understand the world. And that's the key thing. It all does with context. It gives us context. So the key to good decision making is to employ both thinking and feeling in our decisions. And the feeling end is the is the emotions. People who know their own emotions are often good at reading others' emotions and maybe more effective in their job. So if you're aware of your emotions, we don't deny the fact they exist, but if, if we can manage them, we're good at managing others. So the entire workplace can be affected by positive or negative workplace emotions. Um, uh, you know, one recent study found that when leaders were in a positive mood, individual group members experienced better moods and uh, groups had a more positive tone. Groups whose leaders had a positive mood were also found to easier to coordinate. So it was easier to manage. So this positivity, and I, I think, uh, I think, uh, what's her name, Waylon? Uh, 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 Jill. Waylon? Jill, Jill, that's her name. Yeah. You know, when I watch her, she's always, if you watch these tea talks that she has, she's always talking about this, this same thing, right? It's along the same lines. It's a positive, breeds positivity. And I, I give her that. And then again, she's very much focused on this concept. Out of this concept, and this is something that's really come up in the last 20 odd years. This idea of emotional intelligence, sometimes it's called EI not to be confused with employment insurance. And just like we got this, uh, you, you can go and calculate someone's uh, intelligence, their IQ, you know, their intelligence quotient, how smart they are. There's another measure that's come up called the EI measure, which is how stable they are, or how emotionally stable are they. And what we try to do in a workplace is to have people that are not only thinkers, but also feelers, and it's important. And, and normally, you know, this is, as I said to you, you talk about the difference between the sexes. Women tend to have a higher emotional intelligence level than men. That's just the nature of the beast. So emotional intelligence is a person's ability to be self-aware, to recognize one's own emotions, and when one is experiencing them, how to manage them, uh, to detect emotions of others, and to manage emotions. So, you know, from a manager's point of view, that's important. That's important because you're going to run into that whenever you're working with people. You're going to have this emotional uh, roller coaster often when you're working with people, and you have to recognize people's emotions and be able to deal with them. So, I've got this little quiz here, too, as well on the EQ, the EQ, sometimes they're called EQ, emotional quotient uh, quiz. So we're going to look at that next week. That's that's one of the ones that I want us to take a look at. So we'll be doing that. Next week, too, we're also going to be looking at this, how Machiavellian are you? Now, Machiavellian, that's a fancy old um, uh, war horse, Machiavellian. Um, and if you think of Donald Trump and you impose him on that, Trump Trumpism and Machiavellianism is the same. Machiavellian was a, a, a warrior who won all his wars, very macho male, okay? And the question is, how macho male are you, even though you may not be male? So this is, a, this, is a, this type of analysis. And we're going to take a look, too, at... Um, how good are you from an emotional point of view at self-monitoring your emotions? So we're going to take a look at that as well. And uh, the idea of a risk taker, that is a, a feeler versus an intuitive person, we're going to look at your level of risk. So next week, we're looking at some of these exercises here and just to kind of gauge where we sit on those various polls that we talked about with regards to personality, perception, and emotions.